Hello, and welcome to World of Warbirds. I'm Brian Pierce. When I first decided to do this episode on the Mitchell Bomber, I thought about calling it the B-25 Mitchell, the Marvelous Medium. Then I thought that maybe that was too corny and decided against the title. Now that I've finished writing the episode, I think it's an appropriate title. Corny language or not, the B-25 was most definitely a marvelous medium bomber, and that's what's going to be the title. A reminder before we get started that you can always check out the pictures on the World of Warbirds Facebook page in order to see the various aircraft described today. There are certain warbirds that never really seem to come into their own, like the fairy battle. Others, when they are introduced, like Japan's Mitsubishi Zero and the British Hawker Hurricane, are at the top of their game when they are introduced and are eclipsed or superseded during the course of the war. Others are introduced, do well, are updated and modified again and again for different roles and missions, and then they just keep on doing great work. Some even remain in service after the war in the military or even into the civilian world. One example of this is the subject of this episode, the B-25 Mitchell. Design, Development, and Prototypes. In 1938, the United States Army Air Corps issued a circular, which is basically a request or shopping list for what they were looking for in new bombers. This circular, numbered 38-385, requested a payload of 1,200 pounds, a range of 1,200 miles, at more than 200 miles per hour. Several companies took up the challenge to build this new bomber, including Boeing Stearman, Douglas, Martin, and North American. North American's contender was called the NA-40. I'll post a picture on the Facebook page. It most definitely looks like a Mitchell, but shorter, kind of stubby, and also from a head-on view, you can see a difference in the wing design that we'll be discussing later. Also, the two pilots were arranged in a tandem cockpit, meaning one behind the other. The company was initially disappointed with the aircraft's performance. However, swapping its two 1,100 horsepower Pratt & Whitney engines for two 1,600 horsepower Wright R2600 twin cyclones solved the power problem. It presented the updated bomber to the Army for evaluation. On the 11th of April 1939, the only NA-40 in existence took off with test pilots at the controls, suffered a propeller problem and an engine failure, and crash landed. The good news was that the crew escaped unhurt. The bad news was that the only prototype was destroyed and so North American was out of the competition. They went back to the drawing board, and Douglas's proposal, the DB-7, ended up getting the contract and became the A-20 Havoc, even though their prototype crashed in evaluation also. In March of 1939, the Army Air Corps issued a new circular, again looking for a medium bomber, but this time able to carry a payload of 2,400 pounds, a range of 1,200 miles, at 300 miles per hour. North American used the design for the NA-40 to work on plans for the experimental version of the Mitchell, which was known as the YB-25. Lee Atwood, who was North American's vice president and chief engineer, was in charge of the project. In order to meet the new requirements, the new airplane was made slightly bigger, with the wing area being 10 square feet larger and the fuselage was 6 feet longer. The new airplane was also heavier at 28,000 pounds as compared to 20,000 pounds for the NA-40. In order to fit the new increased bomb load required, the fuselage was widened and the tandem cockpit was replaced by a side-by-side -side cockpit. I've almost omitted giving a description of what the Mitchell looks like, because irrationally, I guess, I thought it seemed like everyone should know. The aircraft was a twin-engine, medium-sized bomber with tricycle undercarriage and twin rudders. 
I tried to find out the rationale behind the twin tail design, but even the Smithsonian's website says, to quote, the origins of the distinctive twin vertical fin and rudder layout on the B-25 remains obscure, but may simply have been a designer's whim. Whatever the original intent, it made the Mitchell rock solid and controllable if an engine quit. End of quote. It also provided redundancy. If one rudder got shot up in combat, well, then there was always the other one. The bomber was to have a crew of five, including a pilot, co-pilot, bombardier, navigator slash radio operator, and gunner. It was armed with four machine guns on flexible mounts, one thirty cal in the nose, which could be installed on any of the three ball and socket mounts in the nose, one which pointed straight ahead and one on each side. Another thirty cal was mounted behind a pexiglass hatch cut into the upper rear fuselage. A third thirty cal had firing positions at each waist window and from a hole in the floor. There was a fifty cal machine gun in the extreme tail mounted in an unusual looking streamlined canopy where the tail gunner lay prone in this position to sight and fire his gun. The Army was impressed enough with the design that it purchased the plane off the drawing board, ordering 162 without even seeing a prototype. Another medium bomber, the Martin B-26 Marauder, was also ordered for this same contract in the same manner. The first two B-25s came off the production line and were sent for flight testing at Wright Field, Ohio. A problem was immediately encountered. The airplane had a stability problem, which was known as Dutch roll. There are several types of stability at play in an aircraft. Lateral stability is the tendency for the wings to return to level after being displaced. In the B-25, this was partly accomplished by the dihedral of the wing. Dihedral is the angle at which the wing slopes up to the wingtip from where it is attached to the fuselage. On these first B-25s, the dihedral was set at 3 degrees for the whole length of the wing. Directional stability is what keeps the nose of the aircraft pointing forward and is mainly achieved by the tail fin, or in the B-25's case, fins. Dutch roll happens when the lateral stability is more powerful than the directional stability and the aircraft tends to yaw, which means that its nose goes right and left and then the airplane rolls back and forth. This was not good for an aircraft that was supposed to be a stable, level bombing platform. To fix the problem, North American reduced the overall dihedral of the wing by making it a gull wing. The wing sloped up to the engine nacelle with the same dihedral as before, and from there to the wingtip it is horizontal, this allowing for more directional stability and all future B-25s were built with this wing. Supposedly, it was Lee Atwood's idea to name the B-25 after General Billy Mitchell. I am ready to be found wrong, but I cannot think of any other American aircraft type that has been named after an individual. General Mitchell has quite the story all on his own, and I plan to tell it during a bonus episode on Big Bombers and the theory of strategic bombing, which will help get us set up for talking about Lancasters, Halifaxes, liberators, and fortresses. Suffice it to say that Mitchell is now regarded as the father of the United States Air Force, even though, at one time, he was demoted and even court-martialed for his views on air power. It is fitting that an aircraft that saw so much long-lasting success and fame should carry his name. Production North American Aviation was a very busy company during the war. Not only were they producing the B-25, but they were also simultaneously building trainers known as Texans in the States or Harvards in Commonwealth countries. And of course, they were also building fighters, the P-51 Mustang. B-25s were being built in its Inglewood main plant and in Kansas City. Almost 10,000 Mitchells of all types were built. 
As I said at the start of this episode, the B-25 was one of those aircraft platforms that seemed to be able to welcome endless modification. I will mention some of these here, and others will come up during the section on operational history. The first variant, the A, was to get the aircraft ready for combat. It added armor for the crew and self-sealing fuel tanks. It became apparent early on the B-25 was not armed sufficiently, and so the B variant was meant to solve this problem. The strange tailgun position was changed to a more conventional tailgun, and a dorsal turret was added with twin 50 caliber machine guns. It was this type that flew on the Doolittle raid, and 23 were also supplied to the British. The C and D variant added upgraded engines, de-icing equipment, and nose armament was beefed up to two 50 caliber machine guns, one fixed firing straight ahead and one flexible. They built almost 4,000 of these types and they were also used by the UK, Canada, China, the Netherlands and the Soviet Union. 45 Mitchells were also set up for photographic reconnaissance. All of the armament, armor and bombing equipment were omitted and three K-17 cameras were installed. Four were converted to weather reconnaissance, where they were especially useful on the North Atlantic ferry routes, where aircraft were being flown over to Europe. There were several gunship versions, which will be described in much greater detail later, and there were even two executive VIP transports used by Hap Arnold and Dwight D. Eisenhower. Operational History Many B-25 served in the Pacific. Jungle warfare made medium height level bombing not very practical. However, as has been alluded to before, the Mitchell proved highly adaptable for low level attack. Instead of dropping bombs from way up, the B 25s could come in low over jungle clearings and drop bombs that were fitted with parachutes so they wouldn't fall too fast, explode, and bring down their own aircraft. Strafing became a favorite with more and more guns being added by field modification. Paul Irvin Pappy Gunn was a naval aviator and former mechanic who had a knack for coming up with innovations. He was field modifying B-25s to have up to 18 50 caliber machine guns in the nose firing forward as a pure strafing machine. The B-25G, H, and J were North America's more official answer to a request for anti-shipping and ground attack capability. They mounted more forward-facing machine guns, including some in fuselage-mounted pods, and a 75 mm that's a 2.95 inch M4 cannon. As if it weren't enough, the J version could even fire rockets from underwing rails fitted to fire outside of the propeller arcs. Over 5,000 of these types were built, with the J version being the last of the line. An anti-ship technique learned in the Pacific was known as skip bombing, where the aircraft would fly low to the water, basically at the height of the mast, aim directly at the target ship, and then release the bomb like a torpedo bomber, except that the bomb would bounce several times like a stone skipping on a lake and strike the side of the ship. The B-25 was used in North Africa, Sicily, and the Italian campaigns in not only level bombing, but also in anti-shipping and ground attack roles. The RAF took possession of almost 900 Mitchells and used them to strike out at occupied Europe to support the Normandy invasion, and some were relocated to the continent for operations in the drive to the heart of Germany. Interestingly enough, the U.S. Air Force did not use B-25s in Europe. The Royal Canadian Air Force, RCAF, received about 162 Mitchells and used them for training during the war. As part of the British Commonwealth Air Training Plan, Mitchells were used along with B-24 Liberators for the heavy conversion process, which eased new pilots into the role of flying the big bombers. The RCAF continued operations with Mitchells until 1963, even receiving, in quotes, new J models in 1951. Well, they were new for the Canadians. 
The Soviet Union received almost 900 B-25s of various types under Lend-Lease. These were delivered to Russia via the Alaska-Siberia ferry route. They also received one special B-25, which arrived after the Doolittle raid on Japan. But more on that later. The Russians used their B-25s as a ground support and tactical daylight bomber, and they served everywhere from Stalingrad until the surrender and beyond. NATO used the codename BANK for B-25s serving with the Soviet Air Force during the Cold War. B-25s also served with the Air Forces of Australia, the Free Dutch, China, Brazil, and the Free French. Pilots Normally in this section I would profile a pilot, known or not, who had flown the type and hopefully pass on their impressions of operating it and tell a story or two of their missions. With an account of the B-25, there is no way to avoid talking about Lieutenant Colonel James Doolittle. Jimmy Doolittle is one of those amazing individuals where, after reading his biography, one shakes one's head and says, how is it even possible that this one guy did so much? He was born in 1896 in California, but spent much of his youth in Alaska. In 1917, he enlisted in the Signal Corps Reserve as a flying cadet, and he received his Reserve Military Aviator rating and commissioned a second lieutenant in the Signal Officers Reserve Corps on March 11, 1918. During World War I, he served as a flight and gunnery instructor, and after the war was an air racer. But Doolittle wasn't just an aviator. He was also a scholar and intellectual, earning multiple degrees, including a doctorate of science from MIT in aeronautical engineering. He pioneered cross-country flight and basically invented instrument flying, being the first pilot to take off, fly, and land in an airplane using instruments alone in 1929. If he had been born a generation later, he might have been an astronaut, and might well have elbowed Neil Armstrong out of the way to pilot the lunar module to the moon. Before World War II began, Doolittle had already won two distinguished flying crosses. During the interwar period, Doolittle worked for Shell Oil, where many thought he was crazy for pushing for the development of 100 octane fuel, where initially it cost $25 per gallon to produce. With Doolittle's guidance, much cheaper ways of producing 100 octane fuel were developed. No one knew it at the time, but this superfuel would give Allied engines much more power per gallon of gasoline than the Axis's engines had and would be a war winning factor. Just before the war, Doolittle returned to active service at the rank of major and was working with American industry and the British government to prepare for what seemed like what was becoming inevitable, conversion to a total war economy and buildup of American air power in the British Isles. After the USA's entry into World War II, Doolittle probably could have continued to serve his country in an important but safe capacity as a staff officer. However, about a month after the Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor, he was planning a raid on Japan that Roosevelt hoped would, quote, cause confusion in the minds of the Japanese people and sow doubt about the reliability of their leaders, end quote. The president thought Americans badly needed a boost in morale. The plan was, to be honest, a little nuts. Doolittle and his force would use Army twin-engine bombers to take off from an aircraft carrier within range of Japan. These aircraft had never been intended for carrier operations in anyone's wildest dreams. Even though the launching part seemed almost impossible, returning and landing on the carrier was actually impossible. It would have been closer and more convenient for them to land at the Russian airfield at Vladivostok. However, due to the Russians' neutrality pact with Japan, this was ruled out a landing 600 miles further away in China would have to do. Doolittle picked the B-25 over several other aircraft, including the Martin B-26 Marauder, 
and the Douglas B-18 Bolo and B-23 Dragon. The Marauder had takeoff characteristics that weren't considered good for a carrier deck, and the other aircraft had longer wingspans that were also limiting on the carrier. The B-25 was the best candidate, and although it would need to be modified to carry double the normal fuel load, it would carry a 2,000-pound bomb load to Japan. In February 1942, two B-25s were loaded onto the USS Hornet aircraft carrier, and the attempt was made to take off. It worked. 24 B-25Bs were brought to a top-secret modification center in Minneapolis, Minnesota, where extensive changes were made to the aircraft mainly to reduce weight and add fuel capacity. Some radio equipment was pulled out, the lower gun turret was removed, and mock gun barrels were placed in the tail cone. The ultra-secret Norden bomb site was removed and replaced with a makeshift aiming device improvised by one of the pilots, Captain C. Ross Greening. This bomb site, which basically was a metal protractor, to measure the angle from the aircraft to the target cost 20 cents in materials to build. Finally, extra fuel tanks and cells were installed in the top of the bomb bay, crawlway, and lower turret area to increase fuel capacity from 646 to 1,141 U.S. gallon. Cameras were installed to film the raid. 24 B-25 crews were selected and offered to volunteer for the highly hazardous mission. They trained intensively for three weeks at a secluded auxiliary field of Eglin Air Force Base in Florida, starting on the 1st of March, 1942. Training involved simulated carrier deck takeoffs, low level and night flying, overwater navigation, and low altitude bombing. Several aircraft were damaged during training accidents. However, on the 25th of March, the group of B-25s departed for California for final inspections and modifications, and 16 were loaded onto the USS Hornet. They sailed on April 2nd. On the 18th of April, when they were still 750 miles from Japan, the task force was spotted by a Japanese patrol craft, which, although was sunk by gunfire, managed to radio in a warning to Tokyo. Although they were 10 hours early and 170 miles further away than they had planned, Doolittle decided to go anyway. Unbelievably, none of the pilots, including Doolittle, had made a carrier takeoff before, but they all did so in the next hour, using about 467 feet of runway to get their heavily laden B-25s off of the deck. Six hours after launch, around noon Japanese time, the 16 bombers hit 10 military or industrial targets in Tokyo, Yokohama, Yokosuka, Nagoya, Kobe, and Osaka. Only one B-25 received any battle damage from AA fire. Following the attack, the raiders continued on towards China, where all either crash-landed, ditched, or crashed after the crew bailed out. Doolittle himself was, in quotes, lucky, to parachute into a soft dung heap, which protected his previously injured ankle from breakage. The only B-25 to survive the raid intact was the one which ended up landing in the Soviet Union. This aircraft survived until 1950, when it was sadly destroyed in hangar fire. Even though all these aircraft were lost, 69 of the 80 flyers escaped to get home. Three were killed in action, and eight were captured. Doolittle thought that he might get court-martialed for deciding to attack even when they were spotted so far from Japan, and the fact that he lost all of his aircraft. However, he ended up receiving the Medal of Honor, and going on to be promoted to general and commanding the 12th, 15th, and finally the mighty 8th Air Forces. The raid itself, although it did little material damage, was a huge boost to American morale and an embarrassment to the Japanese government. It is thought that the Japanese efforts to close the gap in their Pacific defenses led to their attack on Midway, which, of course, was a major turning point in the Pacific War.
Although I could go on and on about the Doolittle Raid, it is not the purview of this podcast. The B-25s had performed admirably during the raid and proved that they were highly capable and highly adaptable to roles for which they had not been originally intended. Now we're going to move from talking about this group of famous B-25s to a single infamous B-25. On Saturday, July 28, 1945, a B-25 named Old John Feather Merchant, piloted by Lieutenant Colonel William F. Smith, Jr., departed Bedford Army Air Base in Massachusetts to Newark Airport in New Jersey on a routine personnel transport flight. At 9.40 a.m., while attempting to land in zero-visibility fog, the B-25 slammed into the 79th floor of the Empire State Building in New York City. The three crew and 11 people in the building were killed. Betty Lou Oliver was working as an elevator operator that day. When the airplane hit, her elevator's cables were cut, and the elevator, and she, fell 75 stories, ending up in the basement. She survived, and this feat still stands today as the Guinness World Record for the longest surviving elevator fall. Surviving aircraft. I feel like I keep harping on this, but it is a testament to the versatility and adaptability of the B-25 that so many of them continued in military or civilian service long after the guns of World War II had gone silent. Some served another 15 to 20 years in various air forces, and then many went on to work as civilian transports and aerial surveyors. Some went on to continue fighting, not by dropping bombs or strafing, but by dropping water and flame retardants for fighting fires. Eighteen became movie stars when they were purchased for the filming of the 1970 Paramount film Catch-22. Because of all this, there are many, many surviving examples of the B-25, including a fair number that are airworthy. I will profile only two. Mitchell 40-2168, known as Miss Hap, was one of the first few B-25s built and originally had the constant dihedral wings. It had its outer wing panels revised to zero-degree dihedral, and it flew for several years as an administrative and training aircraft. In 1943, it was modified to be an executive transport and was set aside as General Hap Arnold's personal airplane. After the war, it was sold as surplus on the commercial market, passing through several owners, including Howard Hughes. The plane remains in airworthy condition, as November 2825 Bravo and Mishap has been flying in air shows for the American Air Power Museum for over 30 years. The Canadian Warplane Heritage Museum's B-25J, known as Hot Gen, was built in Kansas City in 1945, but never saw active military service. It flew as a civilian transport for years, and then was spotted, abandoned, at Wilmington Airport in Delaware in 1975, where it was acquired for the museum. After sufficient repairs to return it to airworthy status, the aircraft was flown to the museum where it was extensively restored as a B-25 of RAF No. 98 Squadron. This squadron fought over Northwest Europe during the last two years of the war and is dedicated to all of the Canadian airmen who flew with the squadron. In the marvelous medium bomber, the B-25 Mitchell. Be sure to share this podcast with any folks whom you think would appreciate it, and also check out the B-25 pictures on the World of Warbirds Facebook page.